probably aware of the new Analytica 5.0 release, and you're watching this video to find out what's new, what differences you're going to have to get used to, what great new features you're going to benefit from. I'm Lonnie Christman, CTO of Lumina Decision Systems, and in this video, I'd like to show you some of the new enhancements. I'd be honored if you'd join me. When you first launch Analytica 5.0, you're met with a new intro screen. I really like this screen. It was the brainchild of Jan Wong, and the graphical design and implementation was by Karen Lee while they were both here at Lumina. Both of these ex-luminaries are off pursuing graduate school now, so good luck, guys. On the right side of the screen are shortcuts to models that you've used recently. You can see a shortcut to the Analytica tutorial. There's a few example models that you can click on. And there's a link here to more example models, which I'm going to click on now. When I click on that, you see a list of the folders. You can drill into these folders and select one of the models inside, open it up, play with it, learn a little bit about Analytica. Let's close this one, though, and go back to the intro screen. Up at the top, you can search the Analytica Wiki. So the Analytica Wiki is the central repository of all of Analytica's reference materials, including the user guide and much more. You can type Analytica 5.0 up here and hit enter, and it will jump to the page on what's new in Analytica 5.0. This has all of the enhancements I'm talking about today, plus a lot that I'm not going to have time to get to. This is cool. If you hover over the recent models, you can see a description of the model and the full file path show up, which can be very helpful. And if you want to go start your own model from scratch, go over and click on Blank Model, which I just did. And here we could say, enter our new title, demo of what's new. One thing is, each of the windows in Analytica now have a separate icon. You can see the object window has an object window icon, and the diagram has a diagram icon. And so this kind of helps you keep track of which kind of window you're looking at. Closing this one. You might also notice that the hierarchy stripe is on by default. This is a really nice stripe that has been there, but a lot of people didn't realize it was an option, and it kind of keeps track of where you are. So if we create a module, and we jump into that module, and we create another module, and jump into that module, you can see the hierarchy shows us where we are in that, and we can jump to the different modules by clicking on there. I'm going to create a few other nodes here to show some things. So let's start with revenue and, and expenses, earnings. Okay. Now, Analytica 5.0 has only two modes now. It has browse mode and it has edit mode. Now, you might recall that in Analytica 4.6, there were actually three edit modes, browse, edit, and arrow modes. And if you wanted to draw an arrow, you had to actually go to arrow mode, and then you could draw your arrow. And then if you wanted to move a node, you had to go back to edit mode to move the node. And so you found yourself switching back and forth between arrow modes and move mode. But with only one mode, it's a lot more convenient now, but you have to draw arrows differently. So when you want to draw an arrow now, what you do is you hover over the node where you want to start the arrow, and you click on this arrow icon, and you drag to the node that you want to put the arrow to. You can undraw in the same way. If you want, you can select multiple nodes and hover over any of them to start the arrow draw and draw your arrows. Moving nodes has a really subtle difference as well. This is something that actually I like a lot. Something that would often happen to me in the previous Analytica is I'd be working really quickly and I'd go over to select a node and my mouse would be moving really fast as I clicked and I would drag it a little bit. And so I spent a lot of time like unmoving these nodes that I accidentally moved and I find this does not happen to me anymore. And the reason is if you start moving or if you click on a node that's not selected and you start moving it, there's kind of a delay before it starts moving. I don't know if you saw that. Cool. So on expenses here, I move towards it, I push down, and then you see it's kind of a delay before it starts moving. So to me, it kind of feels sticky as I'm using it. That's how I describe it, sticky. Now, if you want to do like a real fine grain movement and you don't want that stickiness, the trick is just select it first, and then that stickiness isn't there and it starts moving right away. 
That saves me a lot of time. I like that one. These hover icons are one of the most visible things you're going to see. And they're, of course, nice shortcuts. And they make a lot of things more convenient and more obvious. One of my favorites is this T up here. And you click the T, you start editing the text in place in the node. I always found it a little bit awkward to start editing text by clicking in the node, which you can still do, but, you know, sometimes you like that. But it's just the, the hover just seems to be more reliable for me. There's also edit definition here. It's the same as the toolbar button right now, but it, you don't have to move your mouse all the way up to the top, so that saves a, a second. And I define this as a table, and you'll see that icon actually is now a table icon. It opens the edit table. So it gives you a little bit of clue up that the node contains a table as well. Um, let's see, over here at earnings, this one right here is called the object window icon. So it opens the object window, so you can fill in things here. So make this revenue minus expenses. And these little input-output pop-ups have always been really useful. I use these a ton when I'm browsing models. Okay. You can see the inputs, and you can see the outputs of a note here. These have always been there, but the difference is that these little arrows make it obvious they're there. So I think some people may not have realized those extremely useful navigation aids were present. There have been some enhancements to text nodes. In particular, they can have a bold title and an unbold description. When you have both, the big T icon edits the title and the little t icon edits the description. Now, if you have only one, like only a title, then there's a little down arrow hover icon which converts the title into a description. Or if you have just a description, there's an up arrow icon that converts the description into a title. Now, as you're editing the text, there are some shortcuts to do this as well, which involve the tab key and shift tab key and stuff. The only one I think is worth remembering, though, is that when you first create a text node, if you don't want a title and you just want the unbolded text, hit tab first and then start typing. And then that comes out as just the description. The node color palette has a couple enhancements. The color palette lets you change the colors of things on your diagram. With nothing selected, you can change the background color of the diagram. For example, or with a node selected, you could change the node color. The new thing is that you can now change the text color by selecting this little button right here. A means text, paint can means fill. So if you select A and have nothing selected, then you're changing the font color of everything. If you have a few nodes selected, then you're changing the font color of those nodes. There's also these custom colors down here. If you have a couple colors that you personally like to use a lot in your models, you can define yourself some custom colors. Over here on the Other Colors dialog, these are the custom colors. The way you set these is first select the color that you want to set, go over and select the color you want, and hit Add. So select the color you want to set, select the color, hit Add. Once you have those, then it makes it easier to just select them and use them repeatedly. These are not stored with your model. These are your personal custom colors. OK, I want to switch gears a little bit here. I'll open a different model. And I want to show you some new enhancements that help you find information. So when you're building your model and you're trying to find that built-in function, what's really nice now is that the built-in functions are organized into a multi-level hierarchy. So you can see that on the definition menu here. The array library used to have a lot of functions in it, and it was hard to find the actual array function you were looking for. But now you can go through the multiple levels here, and it, it just becomes a lot easier to find the function you're looking for. Distribution can actually go down four levels at one point, and so on. So this is nice. Now you can also see the same organization on the outliner window. So you get to the outliner window by pushing the second button on the toolbar. At the top, the first folder is the model itself, and you can open that and browse its modules as you would files and file folders. 
the second folder is system libraries and inside here you see that same organization where you can browse the various functions one of the hidden gems in here is actually if you double click on the operator you get a little cheat sheet <laughs> that shows you all the operators in Analytica take a look at that let's say you wanted to get some information on index length well you can double click on it and go to its object window and I do find looking at object windows of system functions to be useful often and at the bottom under the description there's a link to the wiki so at the wiki you can get much more detailed information on system functions with examples and so forth now almost any place you see this function in the interface now you'll have a link to the wiki so if I right click on index length you can see there's a wiki help it jumps there as well if I'm happen to be looking at a definition that's using a function let's see what do we have here let's say we're looking at this guy and he's using dispatch I say well what does dispatch do I right click on it and there's wiki help on dispatch right if I happen to be looking at the object finder dialog notice there's a wiki help here so I have dispatch selected I hit wiki help and it jumps to dispatch lots and lots of links to the wiki and of course the wiki is the central repository of information in Analytica so that's very helpful now you may be looking for stuff inside your model itself and the find objects dialog has been substantially enhanced so if we go to find or hit control F you'll see it looks a little bit different you can search in any of several attributes or you can search in all text attributes so before you searched just for the title or identifier case sensitive you can search by regular expression you can include you can include system objects in the result and you can mark matches with a magnifying glass so for example if I were to search for all objects that have inter in the definition maybe I'm looking how about inter I'm looking for functions that use interpolation right now I can hit find I can do that and what you see here is it found this one and notice there's a little magnifying glass on the node that shows that it's in the found set it's the only one I see on this diagram that's in the found set let's instead search for something that's likely to have more matches in this model like power this time instead of hitting find which jumps to the first match I'm gonna hit list and there's all the matches okay so there's that one I can jump to them like that um, also if I'm looking on output menus or input menus I can see which ones match so this is this found set seeing it on there uh, can can be very helpful now let's say you're searching for some function and you're not real sure what its name would be so what you can do is you can go to the find dialog and let's say you're looking for some transform so I type transform and you can hit on the wiki and so it'll search the wiki for transform and here's the search results uh, you can see there's <laughs> quite a few things and you could explore further so another way to find information now let's say that you are looking at an Analytica dialogue and there's something on here you don't understand and you want help on the dialogue itself all the dialogues now have this question mark button on them so you can push that question mark for more information on the dialog and here is the find dialog wiki page and these help buttons are on all the dialogues so there's it is for preference and there's the preference dialog wiki page I'm going to now go over and look at tables there have been quite a few enhancements to tables let's start with column width and row height so when you change the width of a column manually or the width the height of a row manually it used to only stay for as long as the table was open if you close the table and reopened it it would auto size again to the content now it remembers your sizes in fact it stores it with the model so you can save the model and reopen and your 
row heights or column widths will be preserved. If you need them to auto size again, you can go over here and hit auto adjust column width or auto adjust row height. You can now select a subset of cells in the table and set their number format. So for example, percent. So in fact, you could even have an arbitrary subset of cells in here set to some number format. Let me make it something that's sort of obvious here. This comes with a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, I had always had a habit of clicking on one cell when I wanted to set the number format for the whole table. I click on a cell and I hit number format. But what happens, of course, is you'll end up changing the number format for that one cell. So I've had to sort of retrain myself to click in the header to clear the selection and then select number format. That's just a little word of warning. You may not have the same habits I have. Now, suppose you add a row to a table. Notice that the cells were filled with zeros, the standard default for Analytica. But there is a cell default in Analytica where you can actually specify what those cells should get initially. So if you want to do that, you have to turn it on in the Attributes dialog here. So you just put a check next to Cell Default. And then you can go to the Object window. Cell default is visible, and you could put in some default here. Quote, N, A, quote. I put the whole thing in quotes because what's inside the outer quotes is going to be what gets put into each cell. Okay. Now, it didn't affect the cell we just added because those cells had already been filled in. But if I were to add another cell, notice that those got our cell default. It would have been nice if the cells for Cambella had gotten those defaults. So what I can do is select them, and now I can say reset to select the default. This part's not new, but in case you haven't seen cell default, obviously here we'd like to have a different cell default for every row in the table. So I'll set that up, show you how you can do that. So what I'm going to do here is go to the variable of this table. I'll duplicate it, duplicate nodes. And I'm going to make this one the default. I'm going to remove the power units. And now I have a table, and let's say that's how I want my defaults to look. So this variable is called generating unit DEFA. So I go over to the variable, and what I'll do is I will just fill it in with that identifier. I'll start over here. I'll delete these guys. And let's go ahead and add a row. And notice that it inherited those defaults. If I wanted to set one of these rows to the default, I could reset it. Sometimes I'll be working with data that comes from an external source. And sometimes in the process of parsing that, I'll have certain cells that have extra quotes around them. So for example, I really want those to be numbers, but they came out as quotes. So another thing you can do is you can select the cells that came out wrong, and you can unquote the cells when possible. Now you might think down here I might try to unquote some of these. and no cells were changed. Why were they not changed? Because if you take the quotes away from NA, it won't be a valid cell, so it, it left them. But if it is something that would be valid in there, it'll take the quotes away. Sometimes in edit tables, we want to ensure that people enter text into certain cells or numbers. Let me show you an issue that can come up sometimes. Probably not with this model, but I'll make it an issue. So let's say we have a variable called a3. I'll just set it to something. And let's say we had a table turban type. No, or turban model. Okay. And we had it uh, set to Okay. So here we want people to enter a turban model. And turban models have to have eight names like a8 I don't know if they do or not, but this is, I'm just making this up, and B7, okay? And so you enter these various things, and it just so happens that a turban has 
an A3 model number. The problem here is that notice when I entered it, it doesn't have quotes on it because actually that was a valid expression. You can enter expressions into tables. In fact, I could enter 2 plus 3 plus 4 into this table, right? And when it evaluates, it's going to evaluate as 9, right? And the A3 cell for Aquahana evaluated to a 3. Well, if I want people to enter text into all these cells, then what I can do is in the cell format dialog under alignment, there's a text entry, and you can put text only. Okay, and so when we do that, you can see that some of those aren't text only. But because it now accepts text, it doesn't have to even have quotes anymore, right? So, and it shows you which ones aren't text. Okay, when we enter A3, you can see this time it actually enters this text. If we evaluate it, it comes out as A3. So, in fact, if you enter 1 plus 2 plus 3, it actually is the text 1 plus 2 plus 3. It's not an expression. So you see the evaluated value is the text 1 plus 2 plus 3. So you can do this to make sure that people don't accidentally enter expressions into cells that expect numbers or text or numbers or text. You may have situations where you'd like to control the visual appearance of cells in tables and you can now control all visual aspects of cells. For example, you can change the fill colors of cells, the font color, the font face and size, whether it's bold, italics. You can change the text alignment, for example, left aligned, center, right aligned, or top, middle, and bottom aligned, the indentation of text within cells, and cell borders. To do this, really all you have to do is select a set of cells and select cell format. From here, you can change borders, font size, font face, font properties, alignment, and fill colors. You can also compute cell formats using arbitrary analytica expressions. This opens up innumerable new doors for data visualization. For example, you can use font size to depict numeric magnitude, or fill color, or cell bars. You can highlight certain cells, such as the top 20 percentile values, or numbers that are divisible by 3 or negative numbers. You can compute the indentation of data from the data, which is nice because then the indentation automatically adapts when you bring in new data sets. Be creative. I look forward to seeing what new ideas people come up with for visualizing data using this feature. I hope to do another webinar in the future on this feature, but uh, just to give you a quick idea how this is done, in the case of negative numbers here that are shown in red, the way this is done is an attribute called the cell format expression is filled in with an expression that says if it's negative, then the cell font is red. Moving on. I want to now show you a new graphing option called Sort by Data Spread. This has a lot of uses, but it's particularly nice when you're creating tornado plots. This is an example of a tornado plot. It shows the sensitivity of an output result to each of the input variables, and it's sorted so that the variable with the largest sensitivity is at the top of the graph, and the one with the smallest sensitivity is at the bottom of the graph, which gives it this tornado-like appearance. The Sort by Data Spread option automatically does that sorting for you, so all you have to do is check a checkbox. Here we're seeing the sensitivity of net income in 2018, but what about in 2019? In 2019, the order of variables changes, as it does in 2020 and 2021. So there's not a unique sort order here, but it doesn't matter because the graph just changes automatically to always keep it sorted. There are several features that allow you to make more robust or nicer user interfaces for the end users of your model. Here you can see a couple input nodes, patient name and gender. 
Notice that patient name has some Q text in the text box. This isn't the actual value, but it's giving me some clues as to how I should enter the actual value. Gender is actually disabled, so I can't select that choice menu. When I start to type in the text box, the Q text disappears. And when I enter something, the gender pull-down suddenly enables. Now I can select female, and another input control appears. If I select male, that input control disappears. And if I erase the patient name, the control becomes disabled again. So to provide the Q text, a new attribute called Q text is filled in. Simple enough. To enable and disable the controls, there's a function called change node visibility. And we set that in logic that we put in the on change attribute. So in this case, when patient name changes, then it changes the node visibility for the gender and for the pregnant user inputs, changing them either to disabled or enabled. The gender pull down changes the node visibility of pregnant to either visible or hidden. Now, if I were to enter something into patient name that happened to be the identifier of another variable in my model, like gender, it will interpret this as text. It won't confuse it with an expression or an identifier. So, for example, if I actually evaluate patient name, you're going to see it evaluates to the text gender, not to the value of the gender variable. So you do this by setting the definition type to text only, which appears on the list of possible definition types. These options, text only, number or text only, and number only, will appear if your variable has an input node associated with it. There's new support for images, manipulating images, resizing images, drawing images, showing images in tables. Here, you can see a pie chart, and it's actually drawn by an Analytica expression. In fact, I'll show you that. It's this code right here that draws it. This ability to draw stuff means you could potentially program your own data displays if you had something novel that you wanted to display. Images can also be shown in tables, as is shown here, where these are both drawn and shown in the cells of tables. And if you have an image, you can just click on it and you can resize it in your interface. By the way, when you actually do click on it, there's the actual object that holds the image and there's the image itself. So you sometimes want to click twice to get the image itself. This makes it a lot easier to include images in your models. which can make your models look a lot fancier and inviting. It's pretty common in many models to have a choice input so that you can select from a number of values and recompute results. And in a choice, you can select all and compute the model for all possibilities. Now there's a new feature called a multi-choice, which allows you to select a subset of values. So in this example, I'm going to switch this choice to be a multi-choice. Okay. So now we have 900 selected. We get a result. But now I can select a subset of values and recompute the model. There is, of course, much more to many of the enhancements I showed today, but in addition, there are a large number of new features that I didn't even touch on. These include, last I counted, 62 new built-in functions, plus a large number of extensions and improvements to existing functions, faster model evaluation, plus it can now make some use of multiple cores during expression evaluation, Sobel sampling, which is a quasi Monte Carlo technique that can sometimes reach higher levels of precision with far fewer samples during uncertainty simulations. It has one of the first, if not the first, full native implementation of the Keelan Metalog distribution. This new distribution type was introduced in a publication by Tom Keelan earlier this year and has generated a lot of excitement in the ORMS community as a general purpose way of addressing the question of what distribution you should use to fit data. There's new, flexible, and robust support for several data file formats, including CSV variants and JSON, plus an ability to read and write binary files. The binary file feature turns out to give us a super fast way of caching and reading large arrays, which turns out to have some nice applications. 
For Optimizer users, I found Frontline's newest 2017 solver engines are dramatically more stable and improved. Also, for Optimizer users, there's a new gradient object class that gives you a nice way to provide analytic partial derivatives in structured nonlinear optimization models. This has huge speed implications for certain classes of algorithms, such as in machine learning applications. There are a couple new number formats. I suspect the general number format is going to be a popular one. And I didn't have time to show you the new icon-based styling options, which some people feel gives a slicker and more modern look to your model's user interface. You can learn about these features, as well as the features I touched on today, at the What's New in Analytica 5.0 page on the Analytica Wiki. I usually just type Analytica 5.0 into the search box on the Wiki to get to it. Well, I feel like Analytica 5.0 is a large jump, and I'm excited and proud about it. I hope you found this tour useful, and please keep an eye on the Lumina blog for future videos and articles on Analytica 5.0's new features. Thank you for joining me, and bye-bye for now. Enjoy!